I'd like to read from the book of Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. If you're using a church Bible, I have no clue. Um, if you want to get there, use the table of contents, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Absolutely an incre incredible verses of scripture. Uh, we're here this morning because God has given us the power and the strength to be coming, uh, come into the sanctuary, amen. He upholds all things by the power of his word. Why don't we stand and ask uh, a word of prayer and God's blessing upon the service this morning. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you through our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, creator God and sustainer God, the one who upholds all things by the power of his word. And Lord, we, we bow our hearts and we uh, bow our hearts and our minds. Uh, we want to come, Lord, and submit before you today and acknowledge you as creator God and sustainer over all the universe. And we pray that you would grace our service this morning with the glory of Christ and the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. And we give this time to you. We pray you would touch each heart. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Morning, church. Uh, Lord bless you for being here this hour, this day. Uh, beautiful day he's made. It's raining, but it's still a beautiful day, right? You're not pushing daisies, right? So it's a good day. Uh, please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, warm welcome to, um, oh my goodness, I'm blank. Leon. 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 <laughs> I knew Jones was coming out. Leon, hi Leon. And your, your wife and your son, great to see you folks. Yeah, uh, we'll catch up after the service. So Leon um, was working with the uh, prison ministry over in Plymouth, correct, New Hope Correctional and then went off to school uh, for chaplaincy work and uh, was seeking to get placed in the, in the VA. So anyway, uh, we'll find out a little bit more about that. But sorry, Leon, for drawing a blank there. No, yeah, so uh, don't get old, folks, right? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Too late. Th thanks, Noreen. <laughs> oh, OK. I thought you were talking about me. <laughs> Okay, uh, Wednesday night, um, we'll be, we're still in the book of James, uh, chapter 1. And uh, a week from this coming Wednesday, we don't have the regular prayer and Bible study because we have our uh, Christmas annual Christmas party and the Yankee Swap, which is optional. If you're not totally sure about all that, uh, you know, just come and enjoy the evening if you can. If you need a ride... Uh, please let me know. We'll try to figure out how to get you right if you don't come out after, if you don't drive after dark. Uh, if you don't come out after dark, well, I can't help that. <laughs> um, all right, and let me see. Um, we're still encouraging the church to build a shoebox online through the Franklin Graham uh, Good Samaritan uh, Ministries. Uh, they do a wonderful, wonderful work, and um, they're credible. That's, that's, that's really important. And um, if you don't want to build it, you can donate. Correct. And if, we'll send that donation to building. Thank you, Jane. Yes. So uh, if it's easier for you to just, you know, write a check, um, make sure that you mark it properly. Um, 
shoebox. Uh, let me see. A week from uh, today, we will uh, resume our discipleship class, and I'd like to go, go back to back uh, the 10th and the 17th, and we won't meet for a whole month after that. So those of you who are part of the discipleship group. And then finally, we have our wonderful uh, coffee hour luncheon today. I appreciate everyone who um, made food and um, makes uh, that time uh, possible. Also, we have our memory verse for uh, the month, and um, I guess that's all that I have to share at this time. Anything else for the good of the congregation? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I ought to just have you do the announcements. <laughs> anyway, um, there are what we call Christmas card lists at both entrances today, and that doesn't mean you have to sign Christmas cards, but if you'd like to, it has... Um, everybody's name and address, contact info within the congregation. And um, we will have a box in the back, a red box um, on the back table. Any cards within the people that attend regularly, you can just leave in the box. You don't have to mail them. But um, this list also serves as our, as up-to-date as possible, contact information throughout the year. So if you need anybody's name, address, email, phone number, it'll be on there. Um, also, I would just ask that if anybody's information is incorrect or needs updating, that you would just contact me by email or fax or just see me in person and let me know so that we can keep it up to date. Okay? Thank you. Uh, my wife works very, very hard at that Christmas list every year and greatly appreciate it. Uh, and it's a great way to um, minimize your expense. What is a stamp today like? 66 cents, uh, absolutely unbelievable. So a uh, great way to, you know, save on postage. Uh, Liz, hi Liz, good morning. Okay, awesome, yep, thank you Liz. Okay, anybody else? All right, uh, yeah, Bob, you're, you're up next, okay, um, for our next song.
our offertory thought comes out of the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 136, verse 1, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Amen to that. Bob, Drew, please come forward. Bob, would you ask the blessing this morning, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. I pray that you'll be with each and every one of us. Be with the gift and the giver. Help us to use it to further your word, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, before I lead in a word of prayer, uh, let me just give you an update. Uh, so Keith Johnson is in Morton Hospital. Um, and my wife and I saw him the other day. Uh, Keith is uh, Keith's a great visit and um, generally in good spirits, but um, found him very tired the other day. So I would encourage you, um, if you want to be a blessing to Keith, uh, Keith will be a blessing to you, encourage you to uh, maybe perhaps carve out some time, visit him. Uh, if, if you can't do that, at the very least, uh, send a card. Uh, he would be greatly, greatly uh, thankful and appreciative of that. Um, Helen and Carol saw Keith several weeks ago, and uh, Helen said to me afterwards, if I ever want to pick me up in my spirit, I'm going to go visit Keith. And so all that he's been through, um, you know, um, all that he's been through, he still seems to stay um, uh, very, very uplifted in the Lord. So that's the situation with Keith. Uh, Dave Norcross, so his surgery was postponed last, um, last Monday. So now we're getting word that tomorrow they're going to find out if it's going to happen this coming Wednesday. And the venue's been changed uh, from Brigham and Women's to the VA um, hospital uh, for the surgery. So uh, continue to lift up, Dave, in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, got a, we, I got a phone call as, from Jerry Hartgrove this past week, and so did Sandy, and he walked five steps. So. Uh, first time in two years, but he couldn't do it the following day. So pray for Jerry. Um, uh, we're going to reach out by way of phone call, and we're going to try to figure out how we can get out there and visit him at some point, right? So, uh, and then uh, please don't forget, uh, um, Patricia Fogal's got her upcoming procedure. Uh, Edie Jackson, uh, Mickey, uh, Rose McQueenie has now moved to assisted living. Uh, in Rainham at the um, American, All-American Assisted Living right next to Truckee's there on 138. 
So a lot of needs. Um, anyway, that's uh, anything else that you have this morning uh, that, uh, that's on your heart that you'd like to pray for somebody or a situation? Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you this morning, and we come into this place believing with all of our hearts that you reign on high, uh, you're the king of all creation, you're the lover of our souls, you loved us all the way to the cross, you came into this world for the very purpose to redeem our souls, uh, to take our sin and to die at Calvary and to be a curse and receive the punishment and judgment that is rightfully deserved each and every one of us. Uh, and we, we don't uh, always know how to express that uh, and uh, bless you and give you thanks. Uh, we're, we're so um, thoughtless to be able to express um, in words uh, what you've done for us. But we're here this morning, Lord, because we believe in you with all of our heart. And we believe that the word of God stands forever. And we put our hope and our promises in the word of God, and especially the Lord Jesus Christ, the object of our faith, the object of our hope, the object of our peace and our love. And we want to bless you this morning, Lord, and we want to lift you high in this place and in our hearts. Uh, forgive us for the times, Lord, where we have not always been circumspect in our, in our Christian walk. Uh, maybe we haven't always deferred to somebody else. Um, maybe we started our day with um, a lot of tension and angst and lacking peace. Or uh, maybe we started our day, Lord, with just not taking the time to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. Uh, but, Lord, we, we love you. Uh, we thank you for your presence in this place, and we thank you for your presence, how you've taken up residence in our hearts. What a wonderful, wonderful uh, truth and thought, that wherever we go, you go with us, and whatever we experience, uh, you're there to experience with us. Uh, and we, we just bless you for the church, this church, for being a part of your church, the, um, a part of the, the, the church of the, the firstborn from the dead, the living, the living one uh, from the grave, the holy one of Israel, uh, that we're a part of your church. And uh, we're so blessed for, uh, to be a part of that. May our hearts be still this morning. May we know that you're God. May you come to each and every one of us this morning in your own special quiet way. Uh, Father, my heart first uh, before the hearts of your people. And may you minister the Lord Jesus Christ in uh, the areas that we uh, in our hearts uh, so desperately need um, him in. Uh, Father, we lift up Dave. Um, thank you for the possibility that this surgery takes place on Wednesday, and we, we pray that it would happen, and that you would give Dave a great confidence before you uh, in his heart uh, to know um, that you're always with him, and we pray that your will would be done to remove this tumor. Father, also thank you for Keith and uh, the way in which you always uplift his spirit. And we thank you for the wonderful mind that you've given him and the way in which he's blessed our congregation. Uh, encourage his heart, bring healing to his foot uh, as only you can do. May the doctors marvel and be amazed at the way in which he heals and recuperates. We lift up Edie. Uh, give her the grace to be able to put weight on her feet, that she might be able to undergo rehabilitation. Uh, encourage Jerry 
and uh, Mickey, may they always sense your presence. And uh, also, Father, too, um, last but not least, we lift up uh, Patricia um, as she undergoes this procedure. I believe it's this coming week. Um, give her great, great peace and thank you for her testimony that you've always been her with her all the days of her life. Uh, Father, and I just have to pray for our country this morning. Um, my, my heart breaks to see what's happening to our country. And I pray that you would visit our churches and our leaders in government and that they would stop and take pause uh, and, and consider their policies and their philosophy and, and, and the very decisions that they make that uh, are just uh, destroying our country morally and spiritually and culturally and socially and economically uh, and even intellectually. Uh, I, I just pray, Father, that you would flood this land with your Holy Spirit and that we would see a tremendous revival uh, in these days. Uh, we desperately, desperately need it, Lord. And we ask uh, and lift up all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Scripture reading this morning, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. And a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. And a time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts. Uh, folks, our next song uh, make room. Uh, I pray that prayer for myself this morning as we hear the word of God and for your hearts as well. Please stand. Make room.
I'd like to read from Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Galatians 4, 1 through 7. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Uh, may God bless the reading of his word to our hearts and give us understanding. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, to the glory of Christ, uh, we commit this time. And we pray that there would be room in our hearts this morning uh, for you to speak to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, folks, we, we have this expression in our culture, timing is everything. And so apparently my timing was off last week. My wife pointed out to me that last week wasn't the beginning of Advent Sunday. It's actually today. Now, I have to tell you, uh, I do make mistakes from time to time. Uh, hopefully, I don't make the mi mistakes with the Word of God. But um, I, I was looking at my phone, and I, and I was absolutely convinced. And I'm not exactly sure. Maybe I was looking at last year or something. Who knows? But today is actually... And we're not very liturgical with those sorts of things, but I just wanted to set the record straight since timing is everything, right? But at least my timing wasn't off like the post office because back in 2007, there was a postcard that was finally delivered when it was mailed in 1914. And it was finally <laughs> delivered in 2007, 93 years later. Now. Being off one week might be acceptable, perhaps. 93 years later, totally unacceptable, right? I, I used to work for the post office. It's definitely not what it used to be, trust me, okay? God is never off in his timing, amen? He's never off. He's never tardy. He doesn't operate in that way. And so what I want to do this morning is I, I want to look at the phrase, in the fullness of time. Because the scripture says in verse 4, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. And so we understand as we look at the scriptures, we understand that that takes us back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God promised the devil, I'm sending a seed and he's going he's to crush your head. Amen to that, right? And... and Several thousand years had passed. And people might say, well, that's a really, really long time. Peter says that a thousand years, like to the Lord, is one day, as a day is a thousand years. God's outside of time. It doesn't matter. What does matter is that he is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as Peter also says. When God makes a promise, he delivers. Amen? And so there is nothing premature nor tardy about the incarnation of God. Because he's not late for anything. Now, I'm, a, I'm late for a lot of things, and some of you folks are too. And some of you folks are also early for things as well. God's never early. God's never too late. Now, I, I just out of curiosity, I looked up some of the secular definitions here for the phrase in the fullness of time. You know, where you go to Webster Dictionary and things like that, right? And they talk about possibilities and eventualities, and they mention about, you know, well, waiting long enough, or they speak to at some point in time, or a long period of time, or a series of events where you get to the fullness of time. And these actually do not even capture 
the understanding of the biblical meaning of the fullness of time. One biblical point of view was in the exact time. Now, that's a good starting point, but that doesn't even touch the hem of the garment. Uh, how about in, the, in, in God's perfect time or in the proper time? Now, now we start to get a, a little bit more on track. And so this is what I, I was trying to find a really, I don't want to say the perfect illustration, but a really good illustration of what would be, you know, expressing the fullness of time. Now, I've got about nine books on my shelf on quips and quotes and sayings and illustrations, and some of them are classic and some of them are contemporary, and I'm, I, I got thousands and thousands of that stuff, right? And you, do you know, after having all those books, you know how many times I come up short? <laughs> it just doesn't happen, right? I could not come up with anything uh, in all of those nine books that would express the fullness of time according to the way the scripture uh, talks about it. I came across stuff about the use of time, about man's time, about quality time, fading time, calculation of time, time in relation to eternity, but nothing about the fullness of time. Now why is that? Because it stands to reason only God is about the fullness of time and doing things perfectly. Everyone and everything is actually in or on his appointed time. Everything. A man by the name of Anthony uh, Licioni, I think he was Italian, uh, Licioni. Timing, he said, is everything. But when they say there is never a per but then they say there's never a perfect time for anything. So how do you have timing is everything, but there's not a perfect time for uh, anything? And I was thinking, you know, that's man's perspective, is it not? That's not the Bible's perspective. God has a perfect time for everything under the sun. I just love Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There is a time for everything. And there's a perfect time for everything. And it's God's perfect timing for everything. And that's what Ecclesiastes 3 teaches us. And that's what Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 teaches us. It points us to the providence of God and it points us to history being his story and it tells us that all of the movements throughout history have been divinely coordinated on the world stage. And you know what? The prophets recognize that too. Especially as it relates to God's grace in Christ. First Peter chapter 1 verse 10 tells us that the prophets searched intently knowing or looking for the time that the grace of God would appear. So in the fullness of time here, again, timing is everything, we have Christ born at the right time. We have Christ born in the right place. We have Christ born in the right manner to a woman, not a man, <laughs> as I'm trying to tell you today, we have Christ born at the right period of time under the law, and we have Christ born for the right purpose to redeem us from the law. And God orchestrated all of this, if you will, like he choreographed it, using people, places, events on this historical timeline. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so we understand now that his goal was to usher in salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our salvation and the salvation plan for the world in the fullness of time. Now, uh, when we talk about timing in relation to people and places and events and things, you know, we, we bring a human perspective, don't we? Uh, we don't generally speak about the fullness of time. Uh, this is why I found nothing in the nine illustration books. But regarding circumstances surrounding events, consider, we say things like, well, he got lost, and we never made the show. That's what we say. Uh, she was late and did not make the flight. The program did not start on time. The car broke down, and we never arrived that night. Or the alarm went off this morning, but for some strange reason, I overslept. The weather caused us to cancel the event. 
Or, here you go, in regard to Dave Norcross's surgery, I was really upset and angry about it, wasn't I, Jerry? And I didn't look at it from God's perspective. You know, when they cancel a surgery or a doctor appointment or something, here you go, you wind up going to the hospital, right? It's like, I can't believe I'm going to the hospital. You know, think about it. It's God who postpones the surgery, and it's God or God who opens an event for a surgery, and it's God who cancels ultimately the doctor's appointment, and it's God who sends us to the hospital. It's always to be a witness for him, is it not? And so our, our vision and our perspective is very, very limited at times. And I think God wants to change that. Uh, in the fullness of time, uh, this can also be can translated this way as well. In the fullness of time is also at the appointed time. Uh, if you notice here in Galatians 4, it talks about the fullness of time. Well, already set the table in verse 2 as he uses the illustration of you know the child not coming of age and he talks about how the child is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father in other words it's it refers verse 4 can take us back to verse 2 and refers to us at the time set by the father and that's really what's behind this term here at the appointed time. And so verse 2 refers to the guardians and the child in that analogy at a set time. But bringing that forward and we're talking about God's eternal decrees and plans are totally anew at the time that he sent Christ into the world. And so like a door has two hinges here, we have a hinge set in eternity with the way God operates, and we have a hinge set in history in terms of how God operates in this world. Uh, now, consider these uh, truths here and these facts. When God sent Christ into the world, the Roman Empire was in place, right? You had a relative time of peace. Even though, even though Rome always was fighting a war someplace in their empire, you generally had a relative time of peace. And that ultimately allowed for travel and for missionary journeys. If you had total chaos, the gospel would not have been able to propagate and be carried out in that manner. Uh, the road system was second to none. It connected city to city and town to town. And, and to this day, you've heard the expression, right? Uh, all, all roads lead to Rome. So that was the empire, a tremendous highway system, so to speak. And then we also have a common language uh, in the empire back then. Latin and primarily Greek made the spread of the gospel so much easier. There was a messianic hope that was alive in the synagogues. There was great expectation and fervor about Messiah in the nation coming to deliver them. Great anticipation. And so what I want you to see here is that God providentially readied the world in the fullness of time to bring Christ forth and to spread the gospel. That's how much he cares about people coming to him. And, and you know, by the way, I see a great parallel from 2,000 years ago where God readied the world for Christ, and I see that parallel today. Tremendous parallels here. We see globalism on the rise and the world connected like never before, almost like a highway system. And, and we see this tremendous connectivity. It's like as if God's going to do something big. Yes, we've had relative peace. I mean, we have wars and here and there, but since World War II, there's been relative peace. I mean, we're talking what? Like close to 80 years now. And don't you have a sense that something big is going to happen? Sadly. We see a common language, English. Brett went to Germany for three weeks 
And for the most part, wherever he went in Germany, for the most part, you know, the older generations, you know, didn't, they still speak in German, but oh my goodness, you know, he could almost kind of go around there and not really get lost because most people speak English, especially the young people. You, you, you see es, uh, messianic expectations all over the place, do you not? You see the emergence of Israel as a nation, that ought to be a real red flag. We see the emergence of the messianic movement among the Jewish people, tremendous numbers of Jews coming to Christ. Tremendous. And with each passing war, earthquake, famine, or rumors of wars, even, even the current events in the Middle East, and all the anti-Semitism that we see today, you know that you're on the verge of something big, right? Big. Our redemption's nigh, folks. I was reading a devotional this morning Time to look up. Time to look up. Everything is in the fullness of his time. The first coming and the second coming. The other thing I want to point out here too about uh, this phrase in context, in the fullness of time, and this is, this is really where you know, the rubber meets the road in terms of the Christian life. Paul is pointing to what God has done for his people. Now, you have to understand that the Galatians came to Christ, and yet they started to go back to the law. They wanted to live under the law. And Paul was saying, look, there's no more law. We're under grace. And the time has come to spiritually grow up. To get rid of the dietary restrictions, get rid of the ceremonial rites, get rid of the elementary rules and principles and requirements that dictated life under the law. You know, I'm, I'm very thankful that I don't have to live under the law because I would be terrible at it. I mean, all the animal sacrifices, all the rites and the ceremonies and all those things, all the things you couldn't eat. <laughs> I love shrimp. <laughs> you see? So... Uh, I mean, this is an amazing, amazing thing. And you know what's really, really sad? There's so many believers that have this tremendous struggle with e issues of eating and drinking and what day they're going, and all of the stuff. And we were talking about this in Sunday school this morning. You know, the, the, the church generally does not do well in terms of translating the Old Testament into, you know, how do I use it today? And it's the moral law that applies because Christ has fulfilled all of the other stuff. And, you know, if the Son has made you free, you're free indeed. I'm so glad I don't have to live under the law. And, and so Paul likens this whole event, uh, verses 1 and 2 here, uh, like a child coming of age. You know, if you're a child in a very, very rich household, when you become a legally of age... Then you begin to receive the inheritance, you see, as it was fully promised. And that's what Paul's getting at here. And he's basically saying it's a time to spiritually grow up and be mature in these things. Now, you, you know, because I've preached here for a long time, you know that Christ is our provision and our security, right? Because he kept the law when people could not. He fulfilled the law when you and I could not. And he paid the penalty so that we wouldn't have to. That's a wonderful, wonderful savior. And, 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 and you know, and, and the Galatians wanted to walk away from all of that. So, so sad. It, you know, it, it's important that we keep it simple when we just make it about Jesus, right? And just, just simply about Jesus and peel all that other stuff away. Uh, one, one final thought here um, about what God, uh, what God did happened in the fullness of time or at the appointed time. 2,000 years ago, and even today, scholars or the world would look at this and they would say, Rome was or is the center and power of influence, right? That's what they would say. The world's got it wrong. The real, the real action 
When Christ was born in Bethlehem, that's where the real action was. The Savior came into the world in a, in a, in, in a place thousands of miles from Rome, in a cave or a stable, outside even the shadows, if you will, of Jerusalem. But you got a small remote place in the great Roman Empire, far away from it all. And God shows up in that still quiet place. You know, we, we take a look at Washington and we say, oh, Washington's the center of power. I, I tell you what, you go to Washington, you tell me if you find God there and I'll go down and visit with you. Oh my goodness. You tell me that you find God in the Capitol building today or in the White House. That's not the center of power. A place called Bethlehem, and that's where God was working in the fullness of time and at the appointed time. And, and very quickly, what, what happens is we, we come to the gospel events and we read those, those events about the Christmas story and we understand that Caesar's decree was no accident. We understand that no room in the inn was no accident. We understand that the shepherds out in the field watching their flock by night was no accident. And we also understand too that because Herod the Great didn't get an invitation, that was no accident. The high priest didn't get an invitation that day or that night. That was no accident. And guess what? There was no great fanfare and announcement in Rome because that was no accident. And what I want you to see here is God works very, very quietly in the shadows at the appointed time or in the fullness of time. That's how he always comes in a very, very quiet, unassuming, and still way to those who love him. And to those who are his enemies, he comes in, a, in an incredible way to deal with them in an incredible way. So in, in closing, if there's one thing that we can learn from this, it, everything is in the fullness of his time Listen, to, it's his prerogative when it comes to who, what, when, where, why, and how. All the time. Uh, you know, they say timing is everything. Perhaps we ought to say in the fullness of God's time, we'll do this or we'll do that. Amen? Anyway, that's what God has laid upon my heart this morning. Let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer and transition to communion. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you that in the fullness of time you sent forth your son, uh, born of a woman, born under the law, uh, to redeem us from the curse of the law that we might have the gift of eternal life in your son. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the message of the gospel, the wonderful truth uh, that, that it contains, that uh, in Christ there is no condemnation to all of those who believe. Uh, Father, may we uh, have spiritual eyes and ears and hearts to sense the occasion this week when you give us a chance to proclaim the glories of Christ and to speak of our Savior this Christmas season. And we pray, Lord, now as we enter into communion that you would communicate to us the gravity of of Christ's ministry at the cross uh, that allows us to come before you this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our communion hymn, 292, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne. Uh, we're going to sing verses uh, 1, 2, 4, and 5. 292, verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Please stand.